During Wilder's childhood, she received a book of verses from Pa on her fifth birthday in 1872, The Flowerette, A Gift of Love. It was written by Anne Marie Wells and published in 1842, 30 years before Wilder's fifth birthday. That says a lot about children's literature in the 19th century. The book featured miniature engravings and short sentimental verse like this one, which appeared on its title page. A simple flower to you I bring, in solitude it grew. Accept the humble offering, I gathered it for you. Wilder also grew up with this book, which wasn't exactly for children, but its illustrations fired her imagination. Pa's big green book, The Polar and Tropical Worlds, a description of man and nature in the polar and equatorial regions of the globe. Wilder identified this book simply as the wonders of the animal world in Little House in the Big Woods and later in the Long Winter, probably simplifying the title to better appeal to her young audience. You can see from this illustration from the book why Wilder and her sisters found the polar and tropical worlds so fascinating. The illustrations took them into worlds far, far away and otherwise unimaginable. This is another book from Wilder's childhood, Millbank, or Roger Irvin's Ward, published in 1872 by Mary Jane Holmes. She was a best-selling novelist of the period. This book, however, wasn't written for children. In Pioneer Girl, Wilder notes, Ma says it was a novel and not for little girls, but she read it aloud to Pa at night by the light of the glass lamp, and Ma read it aloud to us all in the evenings. By the way, you can find digitized versions of all three of these books online. It's amazing, really, books from Laura Ingalls Wilder's childhood, now just a few clicks away on our computers. In the Little House books, Wilder also refers to The Youth's Companion, a magazine published from 1827 through 1929. And like The Sabbath School Visitor, its contents were originally centered on Christian themes. This emphasis began to change in the 1890s, and eventually the magazine merged with The American Boy in 1929, leaving most vestiges of its religious origins behind. In fact, Mark Twain himself, as well as Jack London and other prominent writers of the late 19th and early 20th century, became contributors. This brings me to an important point. By the late 1890s, children's literature began to emerge in ways we would recognize today. In fact, the early part of the 20th century became known as the golden age of children's book illustration, with such artists as Howard Pyle, Arthur Rackham, and Beatrix Potter. From our side of the pond, Maxfield Parrish and Jesse Wilcox Smith. Books by these illustrators remain highly collectible and feature subjects we would recognize today fairy tales and folk tales, British classics like Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland, and The Water Babies. Notice here, too, that an entire genre of fantasy for children began to emerge, first from Great Britain and Europe, and then in 1900 with this unforgettable classic, L. Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Books with memorable, more believable child protagonists are even animals masquerading as children. Peter Rabbit is at once a rabbit and a very naughty little boy, for example. Another significant development in children's books at the turn of the last century, serial or series books primarily, at least in the beginning, for boys. A species of formula literature, not necessarily, in fact, not often, well-written but skillfully tailored to the tastes of a young audience. Series books were long on action, if short on credibility, and offered a welcome change from the quiet domestic tales that otherwise dominated the children's market. Among the most successful, the Horatio Alger series, From Rags to Riches, The Rover Boys, and eventually The Hardy Boys. Girls got into the series scene, too, with the Elsie Dinsmore series and the Bobsy Twins. Still, there were limitations in children's publishing, as an educator wrote in 1908, boys love adventure, girls sentiment, 
a book popular with boys would attract some girls, while one read by most girls would repel a boy. Sadly, this is an opinion that still largely holds true today. And this, many authors of the period, and even well into the early 20th century, insisted on making their girls good and domestic and dull. If a heroine were allowed some freedom to roam outside the house, she soon regretted it or grew up, whichever came first. Still, by the early 20th century, some writers for adolescents began to cast female characters more in the mold of Joe March, two in particular. Canadian author Lucy Maud Montgomery with her Anne of Green Gable series, which began publication in 1908, and Kate Douglas Wiggins, author of Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm in 1904, and Mother Carey's Chickens in 1910, among others. But both wrote in what was considered a very narrow subgenre in which a small child or adolescent, usually a girl, significantly changed the people around her. So by the 1920s, the decade before Wilder began writing the Little House series, the United States had a thriving children's book industry, one that was strong enough to support the creation of the Newbery Medal in the 1920s. Yet Wilder's books were very different from most of the books published for young readers in the late 1920s and 1930s. When On the Banks of Plum Creek was named a Newbery Medal Honor Book in 1938, The White Stag by Kate Ceridi won the medal that year. Set after the biblical fall of the Tower of Babel, it followed a legendary band of warriors across Asia and onto Europe. Pecos Bill by James Clody Bowman was another Newbery Honor Book that year, and it was essentially a tall tale set in the American West. These two books exemplify the kinds of middle grade novels being published during the period, folk tales and legendary epics. Books about boys and girls living in distant lands or cultures, rarely written, however, by writers from those cultures, were also a major genre for children in the 1930s and frequently won Newbery Honor Medals or the medal itself. And of course, historical fiction. But historical fiction usually served up with a heavy dose of romance and sentiment. Even biographies for young readers were fictionalized during the period and well into the 1960s. This book was one of my personal favorites, a biography of Narcissa Whitman published in 1941 but still on my school's library shelf in the 1960s. This book was fascinating and certainly more realistic than most. It actually ended with Narcissa Whitman's brutal death, but it wasn't really biography. It was highly fictionalized. So Wilder's work was very different. As we discussed earlier, her books brought a sense of realism to historical fiction for children, as well as meaty agrarian ideas and the compelling sense of nature as an ambivalent and uncontrollable force in the lives of children and adults. 